Sharon. I wish we could have that music online, but uh, we're not able to for copyright reasons, as you can imagine. But what a beautiful song. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Jonah, the Old Testament book of Jonah. Before we get into God's Word today, it is great to have Isaac and Amber both with us. Uh, they were college students here, and they really helped us out during the interim period as our interim children and youth ministers. And uh, I loved watching their son. He was really focused on that song. So when I was that age, I probably would have been everywhere. But uh, Jonah chapter one, we're going to look at that in, in just a moment. You know, fall is coming quickly. It's my favorite time of the year, other than I have a lot of oak trees in the yard. I don't like getting up those leaves, but it, it's a great great time of year. The air, the air gets a little bit cooler. Uh, Farmville gets a little busier. Remember this, if you get upset when the colleges are back and say the lines are long, they're helping our local economy, all right? But it is great uh, to get back into the routine. You know, one thing in ministry related, and I've talked with ministers over the years, the wonderful thing about the fall is that Families get back into routine. In the summer, this family's gone, that family's gone, their things, their vacations, their activities. Once we get to the fall of the year, things sort of return to normalcy. This week, uh, we start our children's ministry. So if you know any children, uh, kindergarten uh, up through uh, fifth grade, uh, boys or girls, bring them to church on Wednesday at 6, and we'll make sure uh, that they get settled where they need to be. We'll have adult Bible study in, in, at that time also. You know, one thing about children's ministry, it meant so much to me over the years. I was a kid, uh, the joke was you had a drug problem. My parents drug me to church on Sunday morning, <laughs> Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, even when I was in high school, I can remember leaving basketball practice early because I had to be at church at 6.30. And so my parents kept me in church uh, regularly. And I appreciate that because I learned a lot of Bible accounts by being involved in church uh, and sometimes through song. Uh, there was a song about um, Moses crossing the Red Sea and it went something like this. I won't sing it, but it said, how did Moses cross the Red Sea? How did Moses cross the Red Sea? Did he run? No, no. Did he walk? No, no. How did he get across? And it was something like God blew with the wind, huff, 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 huff. He blew just enough, enough, enough or something like that. <laughs> And I could just picture that water, you know, standing up. And, you know, one wonderful thing of the things that we learn as children. So I was looking at a children's ministry website and just curious at what is the most popular Bible account for children. And you know, in all likelihood, what it is. We'd like to say the resurrection of Jesus, but for the child, it's David and Goliath. And you can imagine why that is. And, and, and then I was thinking about Jonah. We're in Jonah today. And uh, very interesting, the top 50 accounts in uh, children, among children, fav children's favorites, two of them are found in Jonah. One, the great fish that swallowed Jonah. We'll look at that next week. And then in chapter four, uh, God's miraculous work of salvation in Nineveh as the prophet um, stood outside. And believe it or not, those two exceeded even the Ten Commandments in popularity with kids. Now, I'm not saying it's more important. I'm just saying these stories sort of grab uh, children's attention, but grabs adults' attention too. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to be in the book of Jonah. We're going to look at these two accounts that made the top 50 among children. But we're also going to look at some other parts of the scripture. And there's more to this book than just a great fish swallowing Jonah and Jonah having time out in the belly of a fish. And there are three key figures in this prophetic book as we go through it. The first is God himself. The second, Jonah the prophet. And third, the people of Nineveh. And as we'll see today, there are some other individuals and groups that sort of surround these three key figures. Uh, but these are the ones upon which we focus. And as we look at them, we'll study them in the context, what happened then. But also we're going to see truths from each that hopefully will stir our hearts and primarily that the goal would be this, that we would join God 
in his work of reaching people who do not know him. And so we see here in Jonah chapter one, the book begins with God and God is giving a commission. And so look with me in Jonah chapter one, verse one, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and it stretched out and and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, what are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we will not perish. Come on. The sailor said to each other, let's cast lots and we will know who is to blame for this trouble we are in. So they cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business? Where are you from? What is your country and what people are you from? And he answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were seized by great fear and said to him, what have you done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? The sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I'm to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with innocent blood. For you, Lord, have done just as you please. Then they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the, the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, you have the words of life. Father, stir our hearts that, Lord, we would not be asleep. That, Lord, we would be awakened to the opportunities that you place before us, individuals, families, groups, that, Lord, we would share the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us for our neglect. And, Lord, speak to us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, as we look at the context of this, and we're beginning our study, we'll go through all four chapters the next four weeks. Um, but the context is basically this. We do not know who wrote the book of Jonah. Some people will say Jonah wrote the book. Well, we see it's written in the third person, not the first person. And so it wasn't like Jonah said, I did this. Someone else who had accurate historical information, either a contemporary or someone who in all likelihood may have lived shortly after Jonah is the one who recorded uh, the events of this tiny book. Now, there's no question about whom the book is written, and that is Jonah. And we see in this, Jonah was a reluctant prophet. Now, he was a prophet. In fact, he was an 8th century prophet. If we could put him in, in biblical history, the timeline, we would put him around the time of Isaiah because he, like Isaiah, ministered in the 700s B.C. In fact, we know from 2 Kings that he ministered uh, during the time of the uh, uh, king of Israel, the northern kingdoms, king Jeroboam the second. And so uh, a lot of people here, uh, as they read Jonah, they think, well, this is just a fictitious account. They would say it's allegory, but we can refute that very easily because we can use scripture itself to prove that Jonah was a historical figure, not an allegorical figure. We know that, as we said, that he had served in, as a prophet uh, in the days of Jeroboam the second, but even more importantly, Jesus attested to the veracity of the historical figure Jonah when he was speaking about his resurrection. He spoke about the sign of Jonah being in the fish and surviving that. And so Jesus attested to the truth that Jonah was a historical figure. But as we look at the Old Testament prophets, uh, Jonah is unique in this 
it is a prophetic book that focuses on the narrative. Now, now there are narratives in many of the prophetic books. You can read, for instance, what happened to Jeremiah when he was thrown into a pit, and you can read of narratives. But in other prophecies, usually uh, the narrative is sort of an aside. It's sort of uh, attached to it, and the focus is the message itself. Very interesting, Jonah is the type of book where the narrative is central. It is central. As, as the prophet is going through this struggle with God, we read in these four chapters what is happening in each uh, situation. For instance, someone said that while Jonah the book deals with the content of Jonah's message, it deals more with how the message arrived. And so we see that the struggle and the focus in the writer of, of this uh, narrative of this tug of war, so to say, between God and the, the prophet Jonah. Suffice it to say, God didn't have an easy time with this reluctant prophet. And this is some of the context. We'll look more at it. But today, as we begin our series in, in Jonah, I want to look at really two sins that are intertwined in Jonah's life. And clearly, we see them in the first chapter, but we will see these two sins that are depicted throughout the book. And they're not sins of commission. In other words, it's not so much what he did, it's more sins of omission, what he neglected to do, what he lacked, and we, we see that today. We're, we're going to see a developing attitude in Jonah chapter 1 that I would like to say by the time we get to the end of the book, we will say he settled it. But we don't really see that as, as in chapter 4 we see that God is still struggling uh, uh, bringing this prophet where he needs to be. But simply put today, I want to look at two truths of the prophet as we begin the study. First, we're going to see that Jonah was disobedient to God. He did not do what God called him to do. And then also importantly, Jonah was detached from the people who did not know God, who needed to know God. First, these two simple truths. Jonah was disobedient to God. You know, the book of Acts, it says the Acts of the Apostles, and that's right. But I've heard many people say it's also the Acts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, every book in the Bible is really uh, God-centric. It, it focuses on God, and such is the case with Jonah. Even though the book is by the name of Jonah, even though the objects of the ministry of the people of Nineveh, we see the heart of God in it. And this is a book about God. It begins with God's message to go, and it ends with God uh, bringing this reluctance and prophet to the point where he's sharing the gospel message where God intended. And so in verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And the word is this, Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it. Now in this four-week study, we're going to look more extensively, especially as Jonah gets closer to Nineveh, uh, about these Ninevites, who they were. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and we're going to, we know that they're a wicked people. And, and, and if you were in Sunday school a couple of months ago when Daniel was teaching, he uh, depicted a lot of the, the pictures you remember of just the wickedness of uh, of the people of Assyria and of Nineveh. So we're going to look more at that. But today, suffice it to say, the city and the people in the city were a wicked people. So when it says go to the great city of Nineveh, that doesn't mean that they were great morally or, or they were perfect in their conduct. In fact, he says here the people were evil and he needed to preach against it. They were great because they, it was a powerful city. And so God called him here and he gives a direct command to Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah puts a move on in the wrong direction. 
God calls him to go north and east to Nineveh, and it says that he goes south and west to Tarshish. And not only was he disobedient, he was rebellious, so much so that he went to great length to not do what God called him to do. Because the scripture tells us uh, there in verse 3 that he even paid the fare out of his own pocket to go against God, thinking that he could flee from God. And when the sailors said, what's going on here? He had already told them that he was fleeing from God. And so it, it's very early here in the book, and we'll see it throughout. And it doesn't take long to see that Jonah had a heart problem. Now, I'm not talking about a physical cardiac problem. I'm talking about a problem in regard to God. He did not love God, and he did not love others. It didn't matter what he said. I call uh, him Lord. It didn't matter um, what he did otherwise. His actions in regard to God and toward others showed that he did not love God and he did not love others. Not enough so. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 22, when he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to see today that Jonah failed on both of these uh, situations. And Jesus said in John 14, 21, the one who has my commands and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. So it doesn't matter, you know, lip service is cheap. You say, I love, I love. But what, what we see in Jonah's life is because he disobeyed God, he did not love God. And that's what the Word of God says. So Jonah had a heart problem, but he also had a problem of the will. He did not will or desire what God willed. In fact, Jonah responds in, in verse 9 when he's questioned by these people who begin to cast a lot. They found out the problem is, is with uh, Jonah, and, and they say, well, what's the deal here? And who are you? From what country do you come? Who's your God? He says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the land. Now, they had already heard that he was running away from them. Can you imagine what they're thinking he calls him Lord, but yet he's running from him. This doesn't make sense. You know, one thing that really affects people who don't know the Lord is when they see inconsistencies in our lives. I've been studying, I think I shared uh, last Sunday in the business meeting about deconstructionism and how many people are leaving the faith and, and while their, their motivation, their heart is wrong in it, a lot of the times the reason they're leaving is they're disenchanted with people who profess God but do not live in such a way that's consistent. So if we're to be consistent witnesses, our lives need to attest to the fact that Jesus is Lord. And, and our words need to convey the truth that people need to follow. And so I'm sure these pagan sailors were thinking, well, he calls him Lord, but he's not doing what the Lord says. In the New Testament, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. You see, Jonah had a heart problem and he had a problem of the will. And it was shown not so much by what he did, but by what he was not willing to do. It didn't matter his reasoning. The people of Assyria were wicked people. He could rationalize, well, it's in my opinion they don't deserve to hear. But that doesn't hold water with God. He was disobedient to a direct man from God. And we can and often are like Jonah. God has given us his great commission that we're to go into all the world and make disciples of the peoples. And, and we're to uh, go and, and witness and to support witnessing. But many times we don't. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you shared Jesus Christ with someone? When was the last time that you prayed over the soul of someone. Last week we passed out uh, those uh, little bookmarks, five names that you can list that you can begin to pray for. Hopefully you're praying for these because many times witnessing, it starts with us talking to God about people and then talking to people about God. Well, you say, well, God hasn't given me a direct commandment like he gave Jonah. Clean your ears out, begin to listen. You see, God gives not just individual commands, but he gives corporate commands. And a corporate command can be just as direct 
as an individual command. Our corporate command is given to everyone who's a believer, go and make disciples of all nations. Let me illustrate it to you this way. If you were to attend a four-year college and, and uh, you're in your last year, and that college, like most colleges or universities, requires 120 hours to graduate. And, and you arrive the very last semester, the, the penultimate day, you're almost to the very last day, and you have only 117 hours, and, and the dean of students comes to you and says, you have not fulfilled the requirements. And you said, well, nobody individually told me that I needed 120 hours. Read the manual. Read the manual. The manual says 120 hours. In other words, it may not be, nobody, uh, no one may have told you the direct command, but it is understood, enrolled in that, there's a corporate command that's just as direct. And God has given us a corporate command. And don't get me wrong, there are times when God puts people on our hearts. I have somebody on my heart, even this morning, I'm praying for, it was a hero, a great athlete, when I was young, David Johnson had gone with me to visit him a while back. There's a revival coming in Appomattox. The Lord has placed him on my heart. And I've got to go and tell this guy I looked up to that I want him to go to that revival with me. There are times when God speaks to us directly. But apart from that, God has spoken to us corporately. We need to witness. Evangelism starts with God, but we're to be the conduit. God desires to reach through us. And here we see a reluctant prophet. God is doing a work. He's stirring people. But Jonah is sitting on the outside. But I want you to see a, a second truth along with that. Jonah was detached from those who knew not God. He was detached from them. He failed both parts of the command. Did he love God? Could he say it? Well, he wasn't obeying. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But did he love people? Well, really, he didn't. You know, there are two groups that we see in this book. It's very interesting. Jonah wasn't, by his own desire, associating with each. Here in chapter 1, it says that he went down to sleep. Everybody else was on the boat. Now, can you imagine if you've ever been on a cruise? Maybe you hadn't. If you've ever been on a, a group travel and everybody's together, everybody's fellowshipping, and then one person is detached from the group, it's a shame here that the one person who had the message from God wasn't in the middle of the people. They were above, and he was below. And not only that, we see it when God gave him the message, in, in chapter 4 to directly go to Nineveh. He wasn't in the city. Now, he went to the city, and he did what God told him to do out of obligation. But as soon as he could get out of the city, the Scripture says that he uh, removed himself from the city, sat outside, hoping that God wouldn't bring uh, to fulfillment what God said he would do. And so we see in both of these cases, Jonah was on the outside looking in. He was disobedient to God, and he was detached from groups who needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The point is this. He was insulated from lost people. You know, one of the great sins of the church is that. We spend so many time, so much time trying to protect ourselves, our families from lost people that we lose the mission. When I was in seminary, it was very easy to insulate oneself from people who did not know Jesus. It was easy. Uh, if you know where I'm going with this, maybe you've been to seminary. I was in Fort Worth, Texas. Everything in that Bible institution was self-sustained. We had plumbers. We had electricians that were called of God that worked part-time. We had house keepers, cleaners. We had lawn maintenance. The entire place was self-sustained. You could live there other than going to get food. You even had a, a health plan with a doctor that came on campus. Other than really going to get food or if your car, and even if your car broke down, someone knew how to fix it. And that sounds great, like it's some blessed thing. And it was very good. The problem was it was easy to insulate oneself from lost people because you've got this bubble of Christians. I'm thankful for people God put into my life. Ben Lehman, a lot of y'all know Ben. He challenged me. We got out. 
We knocked on doors. Bruce Larson, who's a good friend of mine, he was engaged in young people who didn't know Christ, and he was meeting with them on Friday nights, and, and people like that who set a great example uh, for me. Mike Davis was another one. They intentionally went outside of the bubble. You know, Jonah is such a rich book. But out of everything as I was studying this, more than the fish, even more than chapter 4, which is one of my favorite chapters, I'm excited when we get to that in about three weeks. But more than anything, what impressed me and, and startled me, I would say, is what we see depicted in this narrative here in chapter 1. And it's this. The lost pagan sailors cared more about Jonah than Jonah did about them. Man, that just hits you in the gut. It hits you in the gut when you think about it. Here's a man called of God who knew God, who received the mercy of God, and he didn't care one inch about these people. Yet when we see that the people find out that Jonah is the culprit, he's the problem, and Jonah says, throw me over, they don't want to do it. In fact, they try harder to row back because they didn't want to harm his life. And not only that, they didn't want to offend God. That they, were, they, they so fear God, they said, God, we don't want to do this because if we do this, it will offend you. Please show mercy on us. So here is the prophet asleep in the boat, doesn't care one iota about those who are there. And here are people who don't know Jesus and they are concerned about his life and about what God thinks. It ought to be the other way around. And too many times in the church today, we're so concerned about insulating ourselves. We're so concerned about our own lives that we don't engage with people who do not know Christ. And these people are rowing hard. They're working. They're trying to find out the truth. And we're not being used of God to bring the truth. And it's a sad indictment when lost people care more about lost people and lost people care more about saved people than do the people who are saved. God forgive us. Those names that we have that were passed out or for you to write down, they're not just a trivial exercise. These are souls who need to know Jesus Christ. You see, Jonah here is more than a runaway preacher. He is a disobedient believer and representative of every believer who disobeys the Great Commission and lacks love for those who don't know Jesus. I'm not here to try to shame anybody on anything because as I stand before you today, the Holy Spirit himself convicts me of people that I don't have a burden enough for. But church, we've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. There are people who are living in this world who don't know Jesus. We're going to look at some steps next week for reaching our friends and our acquaintances with the gospel of Christ. We're going to look at it, some practical things. I don't want to leave this series without looking at some easy to apply practical things we can do to be used of God to reach people who don't know him. But I want to tell you this week, it starts with this. We have to have a heart and a will to obey God in this matter and a heart and a will to see people get saved. That's where it starts. It doesn't start with commands that are written uh, on the outside. It starts with the desire of the heart. Do we really believe the gospel? Do we really desire to see people get saved? I close with this illustration this morning. If you're my age or older, you may remember the rock group in the late 70s and early 80s called Sticks. And, uh, and I see some people smiling. They know what I see. Young people say, what in the world is that? They say, sang songs like, come sail away, come sail away, come sail away with me. And then a song called Mr. Roboto, which you got to understand, that's the 80s, all right? But Styx was very popular when I was young, and, um, and it, it was a very popular group in Europe and in the United States. In fact, they had, 
I believe, eight top ten hits in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, seven of the eight were written by the lead singer, who also was a songwriter. His name was Dennis DeYoung. But as is the case with all of these groups, even though Journey tries to go on for like 50 years, um, these groups sort of reach their apex and then begin to decline. But very interesting for Styx, they had uh, these very popular songs in the late 70s and early 80s, and then for almost a decade, they went anonymous. It, it was almost, I'm sure they went on tour, but there were no really top 10 songs until 1991, I believe it was. That was a year. They returned with the top five hit. Dennis DeYoung, who was with the group at that time, wrote a song, and he was the lead singer in it, and it was called Show Me the Way. Now, not the Peter Frampton song, Show Me the Way, all right, for those of you who are older, but it's a song by a similar title, and it's a song of a man who is distressed. And, and Dennis DeYoung, as the lead singer, wrote it. It makes me think if this was his testimony. And so you, if, as you listen to it, and if you listen to the song, it really breaks your heart. It's a lost person crying out to genuine believers. And one verse goes like this. The first verse says, every night I say a prayer in the hope that there's a heaven. But every day I'm more confused as the saints turn into sinners. All the heroes and legends I knew as a child have fallen to idols of clay, and I feel this empty place inside, so I'm afraid I've lost my faith. And then he says this, show me the way. Show me the way. Metaphorically, he says this, take me tonight to the river and wash all my sins away. Please show me the way. That's a lost person. It could be just like those sailors. The people who, even as Nineveh, as is, is, is Jonah is heading the wrong way, are in Nineveh just living their lives. The people we work with, people we go to school with, looking for someone who will share it. Look, we do a lot of stuff that's needless. And I'm not saying it's not important. It's interesting. We're studying in Sunday school today out of Ecclesiastes, life under the sun without a view toward heaven. We need to be investing in the kingdom of God, praying for the lost, inviting people to church, sharing a testimony, witnessing, I can tell you this from personal testimony. The greatest joy next to my salvation itself is being able to lead someone else to Christ. If you've never had the privilege of doing it, I hope that you do because, man, it, it's walking on the clouds. When you feel like God has used me, God do, does the saving, God has used me to share a life-changing message that someone will get saved. Sometimes we just plant the seed. We don't receive the harvest. But what a blessing to be a laborer in the field of God. What a sad thing about Jonah. Now, God worked in these unbelievers' lives. I believe they were saved. They offered sacrifices. They saw the true God. They did it in spite of Jonah. Jonah missed the blessing, but God is still working. Let's pray. Father, as we look today... Father, it's a very serious message. This is more than just a reluctant preacher. In Jonah, we see a picture of ourselves given a command, the Great Commission, but not following that command and not praying for the lost, not witnessing to the lost, not working on a personal testimony that we can share, not inviting people to church. Father, insulating ourselves from this world that is heading in a wrong direction but, Lord, you've called us to send the message that people would repent. Father, we thank you for what we can learn from your word. And as we continue in this study, Lord, stir our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a moment. We're going to.